Greetings! In this video, we're going to show you how bit representation can be used to represent a large variety of data. In this video specifically, we're going to look at how text, images, and video can be encoded using binary numbers. And we're also going to foreshadow the future lessons by talking about the idea of logic designs and algorithms. So in the previous videos, you saw the idea of how we can take a discrete set of objects, like ducks, and assign each one a unique binary value. This idea of bit representation isn't just for ducks. We can do it, in fact, with any set of discrete values. So say, for example, we wanted to represent all of the letters in the alphabet with our um, binary representation skills. So let's say I wanted to represent all 26 letters and 10 numbers, so 36 characters. How many bits will we need? Well, if you remember from the previous videos, you would say that we would have to go 2 to the B, and that would represent the number of values. So 2 to the 5 would be 32. That's not quite enough for 36, so you would need 2 to the 6, and that would be 64. And that would be 6 bits would be enough to represent 36 characters in binary. But it's not that easy, right? I mean, what about capital letters? What about punctuation? What about the space key? Think about all the characters that we need to represent when we are trying to encode, you know, like a Word document into binary. So this is harder than we thought. And then someone must have thought about this. So one standard that we use, actually, there's actually two standards. Uh, ASCII is the one that is for American English. So um, that one primarily concerns itself with English characters. Unicode is another standard. That one is for other languages and it also includes math characters and sort, certain things like that. Um, ASCII uses 8 bits per character and Unicode can use 8, 16, or 32 bits. So 2 to the 32 is just over 4 billion so they, it can represent a lot of different values. And basically all we're doing is completely arbitrary. We are mapping each letter or character to a unique binary number. And then we are going to use the same number of bits per letter so that we know where one letter stops and the other one begins. So this is a high level view of what an ASCII table looks like. We can kind of zoom in a little bit. The idea, like I said, is that every single character is represented by eight unique bits. So we just basically, and this is completely arbitrary, Someone went and said A is going to be equal to this binary value, which happens to be decimal 65, and so on and so forth. And if you look back at the table, they actually have every single character. So here's an exercise where you can decode the various values. And there's no real trick to this. All we're doing is we are simply taking this value, going back to the previous slide, and finding the unique uh, version of it. So. I'll give you a hint. This first one starts with an F. I'll leave it to you to decode the rest. And encoding is even simpler. All we have to do is say, take each one of these letters, go back, and say, where does the corresponding one? So if I wanted to do a capital U, it would be this pattern over here. So this one's fairly simple. It just takes time. I wouldn't ask you to ever remember the table. If we weren't ever wanted you to decode something, we would give you the table. So now let's do something a little bit more challenging, and let's calculate the size of an image. So how would we actually encode an image as binary? Well, the way we do it is by splitting up a big image into small pieces that we call pixels, or picture elements. So here I'm zooming up on a small set of nine pixels. And all I do is I assign a bit to each of the colors I want to represent. So let's say in this case I just want to do black and white. So black is zero, white is one. And then all I have to do is, in some arbitrary order, go to each pixel, and then assign it a binary value that represents the color for that pixel. So here it's 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And when I'm done, I will have a set of bits here, and these bits I could use to recreate the, the image, because I will know that the first three correspond to the first row, the next three correspond to the second row, and then the last three correspond to the third row. It doesn't change when we have co uh, color. The only thing that changes is the number of bits per pixel. So in this case, I have three colors, and if you remember, I can represent three things with two bits, because two to the two is four, which is more than three. So here I have two bits per pixel, and then how many bits do I need to encode this picture? All I do is I say, well, it's two bits per pixel times nine pixels, which is 18 bits. So this, in essence, is how you calculate the size of an image. The size of an image is the number of pixels times the number of bits per pixel. So to practice this, 
we're going to have you calculate the size of this image, which is of my actual guinea pig that my wife dressed up while I was on a deployment. Uh, so you're going to calculate how big this image is, is in megabytes. And you can go ahead and assume that it's 24 bits per pixel. That's what the color depth means. So I'm going to give you a second to work on that, and then we'll go over the answer. All right, so the first thing we need is the number of pixels, which we get by multiplying just the width of the image by the height. So it's about 7 million pixels. Then we calculate the image size, which is just number of pixels times the bits per pixel. So it's 24 bits per pixel, so it's this many bits. And then we do a unit conversion to convert it from bits to megabytes. If this size seems a little bit big, it's because this is the uncompressed size of the image. This is if we really use 24 bits per pixel. A lot of uh, image formats like JPEG, and uh, they know how to, uh, they take some shortcuts so that they don't have to represent, for example, all of this black using 24 bits per pixel. They, they have tricks of how they can represent all these, uh, these same colored pixels with less memory. If you can do one image, then you can do video because a video is nothing more than a bunch of images. And the number of images that we show you per second is what we call the frame rate. So movies will have a frame rate of like 24 frames per second, TVs between 30 and 60, and a video game is 60 on a good day, one on a bad day, right? So to motivate you for what's coming up, I'd like to show you a very stupid video. All right. Damn, excuse me, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm sure that ends up real well for this person. We'll wait and find out. Uh, if we wanted to calculate the number of frames in this video, let's say, for example, that it was a one-minute video and it had 30 frames per second, all I would have to do is multiply 60 seconds times 30 frames, and that would tell me how many frames are in this video. So putting it all together, we now know how to calculate the size of a video. A video is nothing more than the size of one image times the number of images in our video. And the number of frames is basically the frames per second times the number of seconds. So to practice with this, I'm going to go ahead and give you this problem. Let's say we have a 640 by 480 resolution video at 8-bit color running on 30 frames per second for 60 seconds. Here are the big things you need to calculate. Why don't you go ahead and take some time and see if you can calculate the size of that video in megabytes. All right, let's go through the answers. Uh, basically, the number of pixels per frame is the same as for an image. Just take 640 times 480. The number of frames in the video is just the number of um, uh, frames per second times the number of seconds. So that's our 1800 frames. And our video size is basically the number of pixels times the number of bits per pixel times the number of frames. And then that gives us our video size in bits. And we can convert that over to megabytes. And again, this is going to be bigger than you think because we are dealing with uncompressed video. So I guess you can see the end of this video. Don't ever do this. Don't. It's just bad. Not worth it. All right. So now that you've been through multiple videos that talk about how to use binary and how to encode things, you should be able to look at this and tell me, what does this binary represent? And hopefully you don't need a few seconds to think about it because it really is a trick question, right? This could be a number, it could be a string, it could be an image, a video, um, it could be an uh, audio clip, it could be anything. The important thing to remember is that we have the ability to convert any discrete thing into binary, but before the computer can do anything meaningful with it, we have to tell it what it is before we can correctly interpret it. And this kind of segues into our final topic for the lesson, which is algorithmic reasoning. With algorithmic reasoning, what we're trying to do is develop a set of executable steps that can result in the accomplishment of an objective. So the important part is that, um, that they are free of omissions and contradictions. And the idea here with, with algorithmic reasoning is that we want to devise generalized algorithms that can solve problems. So not a specific problem, but every type of problem that is similar. Right? So let's say, for example, I wanted you to write an algorithm that converted a uh, decimal number into binary. 
It's not useful if you just tell me the steps to write to convert 143 to binary. I want to know for any given number, how would I convert it to binary? So the way we do that is with what we are going to call in this class a logic design. And logic designs are nothing more than just a list of steps that just tell you how to accomplish the task. So I'm showing you here, for example, one way to do this. So if we got a number from the user, we divide the number by 2, we save the quotient, write down the remainder, divide the quotient by 2, save the new quotient, write down the remainder, and keep repeating this step over and over and over until our quotient is 0, and then write the remainders in reverse order. If you followed that step, no matter what set, uh, what decimal number I gave you, you would be able to convert it into binary. And like I said, for this lesson, I just want you to be exposed to it. But as we go on for further, you're going to have to write your own logic designs. And these logic designs are what we are going to use as the basis for all of our Python code. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Uh, stay tuned. There's a lot more coming. Take care. Out.